Chapter Seventeen of the Dogs of Boytown by Walter A. Dyer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen: The Test of Remus. The Boytown party was at the fairgrounds long before the show opened the following morning, and you may be sure the dogs were glad to see their masters, though they had been well cared for by Tom. Though technically an outdoor show, there was room for all the dogs in the commodious cattle show sheds in case of rain. The weather promised to be fair and warm, however, so only the smaller dogs and some of the larger short-coated ones were benched inside, where they had plenty of room and plenty of ventilation. The collies and old English sheepdogs were tied in a row in the shade of some maple trees at one side of the grounds, and the rough-coated terriers, the setters, and some of the other breeds were also outside the boys found the places reserved for their dogs and saw to it that they were properly and comfortably benched when the show opened and the spectators began to arrive the boytown dogs were at first nervous and excited and could not bear to have their masters leave them after an hour or two however they became accustomed to their surroundings and leaving them in charge of tom poultice the boys made the rounds of the show under the guidance of mr hartshorn it was a most interesting experience for them some of the breeds were of course familiar to them and mr hartshorn called attention to their points and showed how some of the dogs back home fell short of conforming to the requirements of the standard in some instances they recognized breeds that mr hartshorn had told them about but which they had never seen before there were for example a scottish deerhound an irish water spaniel and some cairn terriers as Mr. Hartshorn had predicted, there were noteworthy entries of Ciliums, wire-haired fox terriers, and Boston terriers, and particularly interesting exhibits of bulldogs and chows. There was one dog that puzzled them, a white dog with fluffy coat and bright eyes. The catalog stated that it was a Samoyed. "'What is a Samoyed, Mr. Hartshorn?' asked Herbie Parsons. "'I don't think I ever heard of that kind.' that's so said mr hartshorn i guess i never told you about arctic breeds this is one of them they're not very common there were individual dogs too that demanded special attention friendly dogs that wanted to shake hands and be patted and that begged the boys to stay with them this encouraged loitering and made the circuit of the benches quite a protracted affair mr hartshorn had warned them about approaching the dogs without an introduction there are always some dogs that aren't to be trusted said he and as the day wears on and they get more and more nervous they may snap it's always well to be cautious at a dog show no matter how well you understand dogs never make a quick motion toward a dog or try to put your hand on top of his head at first reach your hand out toward him quietly and let him sniff at the back of it then you can soon tell whether he invites further advances or not the boys became so absorbed in trying out this form of introduction that it was noon before they had finished visiting all the benches mrs hartshorn insisted on having luncheon i'm hungry if no one else is said she the five boys suddenly discovered that they were hungry too mr hartshorn led them to a restaurant on the grounds and ordered the meal it might have been better but the boys were not critical when they had finished eating they went out and sat for a little while in the shade of some trees not far from the collies and watched the people now i'll tell you about those arctic breeds said mr hartshorn and get that off my mind it was very warm and they were all glad of a little chance to rest it is tiring to walk around a dog show and one becomes more weary than one realizes the boys stretched themselves out on the grass and listened to mr hartshorn's words mingled with the barking of the dogs in all keys it won't take very long to tell you about these northern breeds he began their natural habitat is in the arctic and subarctic regions of asia europe greenland and north america they are probably related to the arctic wolf and they are generally used in those countries as sledge dogs the spitz dog found his way down from the cold countries long ago but he still retains some of his racial characteristics the proper name for the one occasionally seen here is the wolf spitz he is the largest of the spitz family of which the pomeranian is the miniature member the samoyed or laika is the sledge dog of northern russia and western siberia and was used by nansen in his explorations next to the volspitz the samoyed is the most attractive and domestic of the arctic breeds and has acquired some popularity among american fanciers especially the white ones 
the norwegian elkhound is used as a bird dog as well as for hunting big game in scandinavia it is not a hound at all but a general utility dog of the arctic type dating back to the days of the vikings a few have been shown in this country the eskimo dog is larger than the samoyed and is nearer to the wolf in type he has long been known as a distinct breed being a native of greenland and northern canada and was used by perry the arctic explorer the breed has occasionally been shown in the united states there are also a number of loosely bred sledge dogs in north america including the canadian husky and the malamutes and siwash dogs of alaska the husky is a powerful dog weighing 125 pounds or more and is the common draft dog of canada he is said to be the result of a cross between the arctic wolf and the eskimo dog he sounds rather unattractive to me said mrs hartshorn well he is as a pet said her husband but he is a wonderfully useful animal in his own country is everybody rested now i imagine we'd better be going back i want to be on hand when they judge the airedales the party rose and trooped back to the sheds at intervals along the afternoon they visited their own dogs and before night they had finished their rounds of the show but a good share of the time was spent in the vicinity of the judging rings these were two roped-off enclosures on the open lawn with camp chairs arranged about them for the ladies at all times there was a goodly gathering about the rings of people whose interest was in the outcome of the judging considering the fact that there was no lively action like that of a field trial or an athletic contest it was remarkable how much excitement could be derived from these quiet competitions when a favorite dog was given the blue ribbon there was much hand clapping and a little cheering and the boys heard very little complaining or rebellion against the decisions of the judges dog fanciers are for the most part good sports the Airedales were judged among the first, and, as usual, the Willowdale dogs, skillfully exhibited by Tom Poultice, bore off their fair share of the honors. Soon the Boston Terriers were called for. This was Theron Hammond's big moment, and when Alert was awarded second prize in the novice class, Theron was warmly congratulated by friends and strangers alike, for there were a lot of good dogs shown, and, as Mr. Hartshorn had said, Alert was in fast company rover as darley's lancelot of middlesex had an easier time of it for only eight old english sheepdogs were benched and none of the famous kennels were represented here there were only three dogs in the novice class and as the other two were second-rate dogs rover won first place he also won third in the open class but was beaten out by better dogs in the winners contest hamlet however didn't win anything his forelegs weren't straight and the judge took special note of them he had better dogs against him and the better dogs won it was a fair contest but herbie was bitterly disappointed never mind herbie said jack whipple consolingly i bet hamlet is a better dog to own than any of them that's what i said about remus when they said he hadn't any nose and herbie not to be outdone by the younger boy plucked up spirit and bore his defeat manfully it was a two-day show and the judging of the bird dogs hounds and some of the other breeds was put over to the second day ernest and jack therefore still had their exciting time ahead of them but the whole party was tired with so much walking about and watching and they were glad to turn their dogs over to tom's care and return to the hotel with another day of it before them have you told us about all the breeds there are asked ernest that evening in mr hartshorn's room oh i believe i have said mr hartshorn except some little-known foreign ones oh please tell us about those pleaded ernest mr hartshorn laughed you're bound to know it all aren't you said he there are a number of european asiatic and australasian breeds some of which are very interesting but you will probably never see any of them and i haven't a list of them with me when we get back to boytown if there are any of you boys that would like to look up these uncommon breeds just to make your dog knowledge complete i shall be very glad to lend you a book which contains them all for instance there's the german boxer which has sometimes been shown in this country and the pyrenean sheepdog whose blood is to be found in several of our large breeds including the st bernard and the irish wolfhound 
there are other european sheep dogs and hunting dogs asiatic greyhounds and some queer hairless freaks when you've looked those all up you'll know more about dogs than most naturalists do then if the breeds are all used up i suppose the anecdotes have all been used up too said jack mr hartshorn looked at his watch well no not quite all used up said he i have thought of two or three more and i guess we've got time for one of them to-night it is about a tradesman of the rue saint denis in paris a man named dumont he had a very smart dog but i don't know what kind of dog it was perhaps a terrier or a poodle this dog was great at finding hidden articles one day dumont was walking with a friend in the boulevard saint antoine and was bragging about his dog the friend would not believe his statements so they laid a wager the master claiming that the dog could find and bring home a six livre a piece hidden anywhere in the dust of the road so the piece of money was hidden in the dust when the dog was not looking and they went on a mile further then the dog whose name was caniche was told to go back and get the coin and he promptly started the friend wished to wait and see how it would come out but dumont said no we will proceed caniche will bring the money home they accordingly went to dumont's home and waited but no dog appeared the friend asserted that the dog had failed and claimed the wager but dumont only said be patient mon ami something unexpected has happened to delay him but he will come something unexpected had indeed happened a traveller from vincennes came driving along in a chaise soon after dumont and his friend had passed that way and his horse accidentally kicked the coin out of the dust the traveller seeing it glisten got out and picked it up and then drove on to his inn when caniche came up the money was of course not there but he picked up the traveller's scent and followed his chaise to the inn arriving there and finding his man caniche proceeded to make friends with him the traveller flattered by this attention and being fond of dogs said he would like to adopt caniche and took him to his room the dog settled down and appeared to be quite content when bedtime came and the man began to undress caniche arose and barked at the door the man thinking this was quite natural opened the door to let him out suddenly caniche turned seized the man's breeches which he had just taken off and bolted out with them there was a purse full of gold pieces in the breeches and the traveller dashed after the dog in his nightcap and saint culotte as the french say caniche made for home with the angry man after him arriving at dumont's house caniche gained admittance and deposited the breeches at his master's feet just then the owner of the breeches burst in loudly demanding his property and accusing dumont of having taught his dog to steal softly softly said dumont caniche is no thief and he would not have done this without a reason you have a coin in these breeches that is not yours at first the stranger denied this and then he remembered the coin he had picked up in the boulevard saint antoine explanations followed the breeches and gold were restored to the traveller and the six livre apiece was handed to caniche who returned it to his master with the air of one who had fulfilled his duty dumont's friend paid his wager and dumont opened a bottle of wine and they all drank to the health of the cleverest dog in france whether that is a true story or not you must judge for yourselves i have told it as it was told to me and i prefer not to vouch for it laughing over this story and thanking mr hartshorn for telling it to them the boys trooped off to bed so far as ernest and jack whipple were concerned all the interest of the second day of the massatucket dog show centred about the judging of the english setters they had been studying the entry carefully and though there were some champions entered in the open and limit classes and though mr hartshorn pointed out to them the superior qualities of several of these dogs from the fancier's point of view it seemed to the boys that romulus and remus were as good as any dogs there don't set your hopes too high cautioned mr hartshorn they will be pitted against some good dogs and i don't want to see you too greatly disappointed one has to learn to lose in the dog show game more often than one wins anyway said ernest i haven't seen anything in the novice class that can beat them at last the hour arrived for the judging of the setters the puppy class was disposed of first and then the novices 
ernest and jack led their own dogs into the ring with numbers pinned to their coat sleeves the two dogs behaved beautifully holding up their heads and standing at attention as their masters had patiently taught them to do they were both in good condition their eyes bright and their coats soft and glossy it was quite evident to the spectators about the ring that the other dogs in the novice class were not to be compared with them ernest and jack were quite unconscious of the fact that they were being observed as much as the dogs and that there were some people present who admired their bright eyes as much as those of romulus and remus but it was the judge of this class that held their fixed attention he was a brusque dour looking man without a smile for anybody but he had a reputation for strict impartiality and for a true judgment of dog flesh it did not take him long to reach his decision with no word of congratulation he handed jack a blue ribbon and ernest a red one and ushered them out of the ring the remus dog has the best head and most shapely body was all that he said but the spectators clapped and showered congratulations upon the boys and they were very happy i knew it i knew it cried jack in an ecstasy of triumph nose doesn't count in the show ring and ramus is in every other way the best dog in the world i told you he'd have his day good old ramus and right before all those people he leaned down and hugged his dog and kissed him on the silky ear but that was only the beginning remus also took first in the open class which was more than mr hartshorn had hoped for and romulus took third and when it came to the final contest of the winners remus won reserve to champion the marquis a dog that had won his spurs in the biggest shows in the country he was the only dog in this bunch that could beat remus and there were those who affirmed that in another year remus would defeat him ernest showed himself to be a good sport and was glad that remus had won jack communicated his high spirits to the other boys and by the time the afternoon was over they were in a hilarious mood and eager to bring their trophies back to boytown they forgot their weariness and as the spectators began to leave the grounds and it was proper to release the dogs they started off pell-mell across the central oval of the racetrack boys and dogs together shouting and barking in a gladsome chorus it was a goodly sight for some of the grown-ups to see and they paused to watch the frolic i'm so glad remus won said mrs hartshorn smiling upon them all yes responded her husband jackie deserved it he has stood by his dog through thick and thin as the boys and dogs came romping back mrs hartshorn observed youth is a wonderful thing sometimes said her husband i think it is a greater thing than wisdom perhaps a vision of her own youth came back to her for she leaned against her husband's arm and softly quoted when all the world is young lad and all the fields are green and every goose a swan lad and every lass a queen then hay for boot and horse lad around the world away young blood must have its course lad and every dog his day End of chapter seventeen Chapter 18 of The Dogs of Boytown by Walter A. Dyer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 On Hulse's Pond. A week or so after the Mass Tucket show, when Ernest Whipple's kennel paper arrived, he and Jack scrutinized it eagerly for the account of the show. The man who reported it had a great deal to say, in more or less technical terms, about a good many of the dogs. He seemed to pride himself on his ability to pick future winners, and he was rather free with his predictions. Romulus he mentioned favorably in passing, referring to his enviable field trial record, but to Remus he devoted an entire paragraph. This dog, he wrote, owned by Master Jack Whipple, is a twin brother to the aforementioned Romulus. Barring a slight weakness in the loins and a look of wispiness about the stern, he was set down in good shape and easily defeated the other novices. He has the classic type of laverick head, and this had much to do with his being placed reserved to champion the Marquis in the winner's class. He is a young dog, and with proper treatment he should figure in the primary contest of next year. We predict a bright future on the bench for this Remus. 
incidentally the boys were pleased to learn that tippecanoe and tyler too had won the prize for the best brace of beagles in the show besides some individual honors and they rejoiced for their bright-faced little acquaintances of the baggage car the triumph of remus was not short-lived the residents of boytown learned through the local papers what had happened and began to look with a new interest upon these boys and their dogs as they passed along the streets romulus came to be pointed out to strangers as a coming field trial champion and remus as a famous bench show winner such dogs were something for the citizens of any town to be proud of and there were not a few persons who gained thereby a new interest in dogs to the lasting betterment of their characters as the autumn days came on ernest began to feel the call of the woods and fields and begged to be allowed to have a gun and go hunting with sam bumpus he was now a tall good-looking lad of fifteen and he felt himself quite old enough to become a hunter besides what is the use of owning a fine bird dog if you don't hunt with him mrs whipple strongly objected for she was afraid of guns and at last a compromise was reached ernest was to be allowed to go hunting with sam provided he would not ask to own or use a gun until he was sixteen and reluctantly he consented to this arrangement jack who was still only twelve had not yet caught the hunting fever and since he owned a dog that could not hunt anyway he was content to remain at home while ernest spent his saturdays afield with sam sam bumpus during the past three years had grown to be a less lonely man through the boys he had made friends in town and people began to look upon him as less queer and to recognize his sterling virtues and all that made him happier it was a lucky day for me he once said when i brought those puppies down in my pockets it was a luckier day for us responded ernest with warmth now tramping together cross country with their dogs they became even closer friends and there was implanted in ernest's character a certain honesty and a love of nature that never left him and withal it was great fun then came another winter and one day during the christmas vacation mr hartshorn invited the whole crowd of boys up to his house to enjoy an indoor campfire mrs hartshorn as usual spread her table with a wealth of good things to eat and after the dinner they all gathered in the big living room where huge logs were blazing and crackling in the fireplace i only wish said ernest whipple that there were more breeds of dogs for you to tell us about mr hartshorn i always enjoyed those talks so much do you think you know all about all the breeds now asked mr hartshorn with a smile well no confessed ernest but i know something about them all and i have one or two good books to refer to i guess there's always more to be learned about everything that is true said their host and fortunately there are always good things being written about dogs by men who know them i never let a chance go by to add to my own fund of dog lore alfred hammond and horace ames who were home from college for the holidays were present at the campfire and alfred was now loudly called upon for a dog story mr hartshorn insisted that he had told every one he knew and finally alfred acceded to the demand i ran across two anecdotes the other day which may fill the bill said he i think they are both about collies but i am not sure the first is about a scotchman and his dog brutus the scotchman having gone far out of his way in a storm stopped at a lonely house and asked for a shelter for the night the owner of the house admitted him and showed him to a chamber and the scotsman being very weary prepared to go to bed brutus however was not so readily satisfied with his strange surroundings and proceeded to investigate at length he returned to his master and began tugging at the bedclothes the scotsman was at last sufficiently aroused to follow the dog out of the room and down the stairs and brutus led him to the door of a closed room and sniffed at it very cautiously light which made its way through the cracks indicated that the room was occupied the scotsman could find no hole to peep through but much to his surprise he heard several voices for he thought that he and his host were alone in the house he placed his ear to the door and heard enough to make him believe that his life was in danger he was a brave man and prompt action seemed necessary suddenly he pushed open the door and rushed in surprising half a dozen men they reached for their weapons but the traveller was ready first with his pistol he shot his host and cracked another over the head brutus meanwhile attacked so vigorously and to such good purpose that the man and his dog were able to escape uninjured 
he afterwards learned that the house where he had sought hospitality was the resort of a gang of highwaymen the other story is rather tragic but i guess i'll tell it as it's the only one i have left a travelling merchant in england was riding along on horseback when he dropped a bag containing all his money he was quite unconscious of his loss but his dog had seen the bag fall the dog began to run in front of the horse's head barking and dashing back along the road but the merchant who must have been uncommonly stupid i think did not understand the meaning of his strange actions the dog became more insistent as the man urged his horse ahead barking in an unusual tone and snapping at the horse's feet the merchant who apparently did not know dogs very well began to fear that he was going mad mad dogs will not drink he reflected at the next ford i will watch and if he does not drink i must shoot him of course the dog was much too anxious and excited to drink at the next ford and his master shot him after riding on a little way the man began to be troubled with doubts and misgivings and he turned his horse about when he reached the ford again the dog was not there but the man traced him back along the road by the marks of his blood the merchant found his dog at last lying beside the money-bag protecting his master's property with his last gasp remorsefully the merchant stooped down and begged the dog's forgiveness the faithful animal licked his hand and looked up at him with eyes that seemed to say it's all right my master you didn't understand no more stories being forthcoming the talk soon drifted to other things the boys vied with each other in telling of instances which illustrated the superior knowledge intelligence and faithfulness of their own dogs and then fell into reminiscence they talked of the awakening of interest in the dogs of boytown and what it had meant to each of them of the activities of the boytown humane society of the boytown dog show in morton's barn of the days at camp breeches and the death of beloved rags of the eastern connecticut field trials and the winning of romulus of the massatucket dog show and the triumph of remus and of all the good times the boys and their dogs had had together they quoted sam bumpus's quaint sayings and tom poultice's good advice about the care of dogs and they told dog stories that they had read i don't see how anybody can help loving dogs said elliot garfield there are men who hate them though said mr hartshorn american sheep growers for example are bitterly opposed to dogs and many of them would like to see the canine race annihilated and it must be admitted that the dog forms the greatest obstacle in the path of increasing the important sheep raising industry in the united states dogs do kill sheep and there's no denying it i thought there were laws to protect the sheep said ernest whipple there are said mr hartshorn some of them are good and some of them are bad some of them place it in the sheep man's power to take the law into his own hands and act as judge jury and executioner on the spot which of course is all wrong but unfortunately the best of the laws do not protect the sheep the state may pay damages but that does not restore the slain sheep i don't see what can be done then said theron hammond dolefully for one thing said mr hartshorn more study should be put on these laws before they are passed they should not be drawn up by either partisans of the dog or of the sheep they should aim to eliminate ownerless dogs and to make all owners responsible for the acts of their dogs on the other hand the sheep owners should not be allowed to collect damages unless they can show that they have taken due precautions on their own part such as the erection of dog tight fences a man has to keep up his fences to keep his neighbor's cows out of his corn or he has no redress why shouldn't a sheep owner be compelled to do likewise but the real cure for the menace of the sheep-killing dog is more dog the american sheep men don't seem to have learned the lesson that the past has tried to teach them for centuries the trained shepherd dog has been the protection of the flock in all sheep-raising countries and is so to-day in great britain europe and australia i don't believe there are a dozen first-class trained shepherd dogs in the country except in the far west in scotland there are more dogs to the square mile than there are in the united states yet the scotch don't try to legislate a dog out of existence the scotch shepherd never thinks of taking out his flock without his trained collie and the result is that few sheep are killed either by stray dogs or wild animals 
when the american sheep growers learn their lesson from the shepherds of other countries overcome their prejudice against the dog and adopt the method that has been successfully employed for centuries in other countries they will solve this problem and not until then i hope to see the day come when the sheep man is numbered among the dog's best friends here as he is in scotland a lively discussion followed and then still talking dogs the boys trudged home in the moonlight over the crisp snow a few days later the whole crowd was out skating on hulsa's pond a week of clear cold weather following a thaw had made ideal skating and boy town was making the most of it there were a number of young men and girls out and a few older devotees of the sport but the boys and their dogs had full possession of one end of the pond here a game of hockey was in progress which was somewhat interfered with by the activities of tatters who had grown into a fine lively sport-loving dog he seemed to think the game was arranged for his special benefit and he chased the puck to and fro across the ice wherever it went another general favorite was rover who never tired of racing with the skaters and particularly enjoyed pulling the younger children about on their sleds these small children had another name for him santa claus and he indeed looked the part others of the dogs were enjoying the sport too though romulus and remus showed a tendency to leave the ice and go scouting off on imaginary trails in the neighborhood suddenly while the fun was at its height a sharp cry arose from the upper end of the pond where the brook ran in it was different from the other shouts and cries that rang out over the ice there was terror in it the loud insistent barking of tatters immediately followed the hockey game was interrupted and every one looked toward that end of the pond to see what could be the matter tatters was running excitedly about the edge of a hole where the ice had broken in and in the black water appeared the head and shoulders of little eddie green who had ventured too near a dangerous spot and had broken through the thin ice sounds of merrymaking suddenly ceased and there was a general rush in that direction the bigger boys threw themselves flat on the ice and tried to reach out to eddie with their hands but the ice cracked alarmingly beneath the weight of so many of them and they dared not approach too close get back boys get back cried theron hammond who was always a leader get back or we'll all go in they saw that such a catastrophe would only make bad matters worse and obeyed the command only theron and harry barton remained to try to reach the frightened little fellow and they could not get near him the water was deep and eddie was struggling wildly to keep from going under the ice which broke off wherever he grasped it keep calm eddie called theron but eddie was terrified and could not keep calm his head went under once and he seemed to be weakening meanwhile ernest whipple and one or two of the others had kicked off their skates and had run off in search of boards or fence rails to throw across the hole but there seemed to be none near by and help was a long time coming it began to look as though they would be too late it was a tense moment some of the little girls had begun to cry and there was one young lady who gave away to hysterics no one seemed to know what to do it was awful to stand there and watch the little fellow drown before their eyes then there came a sudden rush and a plunge and the black and white head of remus appeared beside that of the drowning boy though an aristocrat of the bench show this good dog had a brain that worked quickly and a heart that knew no fear it was a good thing that remus had learned to be such a good swimmer in days gone by he had need of all his strength and skill now he seized the boy's collar in his teeth and struggled to drag him out but it could not be done the ice broke repeatedly under the dog's paws and it was all he could do to keep the boy's head and his own above water he could only struggle bravely and cast imploring looks toward the helpless humans the water was ice cold of course and it stopped the good dog's strength his efforts weakened and he tried no more to climb out but he never relaxed his hold he would have gone down to his death with the boy before he would have done that both heads went below the surface and came up again and the dogged imploring look deepened in remus's eyes jack whipple called words of encouragement and it was pitiful to watch the noble dog's efforts to respond it was wonderful the way he held out and in the end he won when it seemed as though the last atom of his strength must have been spent ernest whipple came running up with a plank which he threw across the hole 
remus rested his paws on this and so was able to keep from going under but he had no strength left to drag himself and the boy out eddie was now unconscious and could not help himself then elliot garfield and two other boys arrived with boards and fence rails and with these they built a sort of bridge across the dangerous gap theron crawled cautiously out upon this with harry barton holding to his feet he grasped remus's collar and with harry's help dragged the boy and the dog to firm ice eddie was seized in friendly arms and was rubbed and rolled until he revived remus fell faint and trembling to the ice and jack whipple unconscious of his own sobs gathered the heroic dog to his breast End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the dogs of boytown by walter a dyer this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen every dog has his day eddie green was hurried home and put to bed and a doctor was called for a day or so he was watched over with tender solicitude by his mother but he soon insisted on getting up and the doctor said that the danger was past his healthy young body recuperated rapidly and he suffered no serious effects from his harrowing experience in a few days he was running about as well as ever and his parents watching him had good reason to bless the brave dog that had saved their boy's life but with remus it was different almost immediately he showed signs of having contracted a severe cold weakened as he was by exposure and exhausted by his almost superhuman struggles in the water he was in no condition to combat the malady and pneumonia set in for days he lay dangerously ill on his bed in rome while jack hoped and prayed in vain for a noticeable turn for the better tom poultice came down and diagnosed the case and left some medicine but still remus failed to show much improvement sam bumpus came too and did what he could but he was forced to confess that the case was beyond his powers remus was very weak and seemed unable to rally jack whipple was beside himself with anxiety when remus had distemper he received visits from a good many of the boys in town but that was nothing to the interest that was now displayed in him the boys of the humane society hung about the whipple gates at all hours of the day vainly wishing that they might be of some help mr morton mr pearson and other prominent citizens telephoned their inquiries mr fellows came every day and total strangers rang the doorbell to ask how the sick dog was getting on all boytown did its best to show honor and sympathy for the hero but alas that brought no relief to the poor dog suffering on his bed in rome for some time now mrs whipple had been unconsciously displaying a different attitude toward the dogs she never petted them she was not quite ready to go quite so far but she never said anything against dogs any more and she had not concealed her pleasure and pride in the triumphs that had been won by both romulus and remus and now that remus was sick she made no attempt to conceal her anxiety and answered all the inquiries patiently one day mr whipple observed her stealing out to rome with a dish of warm broth while the boys were in school and he couldn't help smiling a little the mother's heart had been won over at last there came a day when remus seemed to be getting worse instead of better and tom poultice was sent for again mr hartshorn himself brought tom over in the car from thornborough tom tested the sick dog's temperature and general condition and shook his head solemnly i'm afraid it's come to a crisis said he nothing more you can do asked mr hartshorn i'm afraid not sir said tom then there's no time to be lost said mr hartshorn we must send for dr runkle i ought to have done it before they jumped into the car and drove down to the telegraph office the next day dr runkle appeared with tom and mr hartshorn he was the bridgeport veterinary surgeon and had come too late to save poor rags mr hartshorn considered him the best veterinarian in the state with gentle skilful hands he made a thorough examination a bad case of pneumonia said he the first thing to do is to get him into a warmer place this barn is all right for most things but he needs some artificial heat now mrs whipple was standing near and jack looked at her doubtfully she did not hesitate apparently she had forgotten all about her vow never to allow the dogs into the house bring him right into the house said she jack you go and get some of that burlap from the storeroom and we'll make a bed for him in the kitchen 
tom picked remus up in his strong arms and the little procession made its way up to the house bringing up the rear came romulus a subdued dog these last anxious days his big eyes questioned the faces of his human friends for the meaning of it all he could not speak but no one showed a more genuine sympathy never before had romulus attempted to enter the house now he seemed to understand that the ban had been lifted he followed quietly in through the door and no one said him nay but i am happy to say that this story is not going to end sadly i don't believe i could tell it if it did dr runkle stayed at willowdale for three days and each day he came down to attend his patient at last his skill and knowledge and the constant careful nursing won the battle and gradually remus fought his way back to health his splendid constitution and stout heart stood him in good stead and once the crisis was past recovery was rapid and certain and that is really the end of the story though by no means the end of romulus and remus they were destined to live to a ripe old age much honored in boytown and to win many triumphs on field and bench i need not tell you how happy jack whipple was to have his beloved dog restored to health and strength again the rest of the family were hardly less so and all boytown rejoiced i will only tell what a few of the people said and did because remus you will agree deserved all the honors and all the love that could be heaped upon him the first day that jack was allowed to take remus out into the sunshine for a little airing there was one who watched them from the kitchen window it was irish delia who had objected so strenuously when the puppies had first been brought into her kitchen when jack smiling happily brought the dog in again and remus whose legs were still a bit unsteady walked over to his dish for a drink of water delia could restrain herself no longer she flopped down on her knees beside him and putting her arms about him sobbed unrestrainedly into his soft coat ach remus dear she said you never knew it but i loved you like my own brother and what did tom holta say after the danger was over he placed a kindly hand on jack's shoulder and said read a book once called the mill on the floss and there was a chap in it named bob jakin just a ordinary chap like me one day he says to a lady he says i've a dog miss they're better friends nor any christian i've always thought he was right jacky and i think so now more than ever mr hartshorn didn't say much he was not the demonstrative kind but every one knew what he thought one day he told the boys that he had just received a letter from a cousin of his in the west who was a sheep man he hates dogs said mr hartshorn worse than coyotes he always makes fun of my sentimentality as he calls it and can't say too much against an animal that can furnish neither eggs milk wool nor meat he calls the dog a useless creature i sat down and wrote him what remus did on hulls's pond and asked him if he had ever heard of a sheep that had saved a human life i guess that will hold him for a while sam bumpus didn't say much either he just stroked remus's head and patted his flank and then remarked i've sometimes thought life was a pretty tough proposition but i reckon so long as there's boys and dogs in the world we can manage to stagger along and bear up under it what other people said didn't matter so much as what they did mr morton quietly started a little affair of his own and after he had made numerous calls on business acquaintances of his a little ceremony took place in the whipple yard just outside of rome a committee called consisting of mr morton mr pearson and mr fellows and after a short speech was made by the banker a bronze medal was presented to remus it isn't to be hidden away in a drawer somewhere explained mr morton he's to wear it on his collar and if he loses it we'll get him another one one side of the medal bore the words presented to remus by the citizens of boytown on the other side was a setter's head and the words for heroism in saving human life april came again to boytown and with it the bluebirds and robins the pussy willows and red maple blossoms and the green buds of the dogwoods that watched over the resting place of rags on the hill with it too came strength to the graceful limbs of remus there were warm sunny days when it was good for dogs and boys to be out of doors and there were crisp cool evenings when a crackling fire on the hearth was pleasant let us bid farewell to our friends as they sit before their open fires sam bumpus and his lonely shack but not unhappy any more 
mr and mrs hartshorn side by side in the big house at willowdale and the whipples in their pleasant sitting-room on washburn street at one side of the table sits mrs whipple sewing with a look of contentment on her face mingled with pride as she watches the two fine young fellows who are her sons at the other side of the table mr whipple is reading aloud from that wonderful story greyfriars bobby remus lies comfortably stretched out on one side of the hearth and romulus on the other for they are no longer banished to rome the house is none too good for them and about each happy dog's neck are entwined a loving master's arms end of story nineteen end of the dogs of boytown by walter a dyer